Dr. Michel Nguyen is a research fellow at the Disaster Risk Analytics for Society Lab in Nanyang Technological University. She completed her bachelor's degree in mathematics with first class honors at Imperial College London, a master's in applied statistics with distinction at the University of Oxford, a PhD in mathematics research back at Imperial College, and then a postdoc after that at the Big Data Institute back at the University of Oxford before taking up her current position at NTU. In today's talk, she will introduce the classical geostatistical model and highlight the ways it has been applied, adapted, and combined with other statistical techniques to help answer questions in context, ranging from public health to disaster risk. Dr. Noon would also outline ongoing research which uses concepts from information theory to improve model calibration of complex physical models with spatial data. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Noon. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Nguyen, a research fellow at the Asian School of the Environment at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. My main research interest is spatial temporal statistics, and recently I've been looking at this in the context of environmental and disaster risk modeling. So before I start, I'd like to thank the organizers for this chance to share my research. So for today's talk, it will be centered around the topic of spatial dependence. Is it a boon or bane? So suppose that we have data collected over a study region, like those marked by the crosses on this map here. Then given our observations, how can we estimate what we might observe at an unsampled location? And this brings us to the area of spatial prediction. For today's talk, we'll follow one man's approach to this problem. And this man is Professor Daniel Craig. And he was looking at this, um, looking at this problem in the context of gold mining. And the, the method that he developed was eventually named after him, Craiging. So Craiging starts by characterizing how different measurements are as a function of their distance apart. And this is expressed in mathematical mathematical terms through um, the construct called a virodogram. This is defined as half the expected squared difference between measurements at two different locations, E of S1 and E of S2. And this quantity is also directly related to perhaps more um, familiar measures of variation, the variance and the covariance. Specifically, we talk about the spatial covariance because we are interested in how measurements at two locations co-vary with each other. So once we have modeled the virodogram using our data, we can plug its values into so-called Kriging equations to give us the best linear unbiased estimates for the unsampled locations. So this traditional Kriging approach is in line with us assuming that the process of interest is a Gaussian process with the corresponding spatial covariance. For such a process, any n, obs n observations um, is assumed to have n variate normal distribution with a covariance matrix whereby the entries correspond to the assumed spatial covariance function as well as the locations of interest. If we want to include other factors which might affect the spatial variation in our observations, then we typically do this in an additive fashion, and this will give us the classical geostatistical model as shown in this equation here. Here, y um, corresponds to our co uh, corresponds to our observations at a particular location S. X um, is our vector of covariates. Beta is our parameter coefficient vector, which tells us how these covariates affect our observations. And E is a mean zero Gaussian process, which tries to capture the residual spatial variation. So one way that we can estimate our parameters of the model is to maximize um, the likelihood of us observing that the data that we have. And this means we use a maximum likelihood estimation method and once we have done that, we can then use the conditional normal distributions to estimate at the unsampled locations given our observations. So the formula for this 
classical geostatistical model is very similar to um, that of a linear model or linear regression, which many of you might have come across. But the key difference here is in the distributional assumption for E. So in a linear model, we assume that E is an independent, identically distributed, normal random variable. However, here we explicitly model the spatial dependence present. So in the figure to the right over here, um, the blue lines might represent a trend that we see just from the covariates themselves. And under the assumption of independent residuals, then what we might observe might follow something more like the orange line, which varies randomly about this. In the presence of dependence, however, what we see now on the right is regions of sustained overprediction and underprediction. And as we'll see later, this will have impacts. So the classical geostatistical model has been used in various contexts, and it has also been extended to better suit different use cases. So one way that has um, been done is to change the linear model to a generalized linear one. So in the context of estimating malaria prevalence, um, this has been done by changing the linear predictor, which was described by x beta plus e, um, from the real line to the 0 to 1 um, scale using a link function g. And then we can, um, we can model our observations, which is typically the number of infected individuals at a particular location, as a binomial distribution in order to estimate its parameters, which is then p, the prevalence. So this approach has been used in spatial epidemiology and the results such as that seen on the right, which are maps of prevalence, have been used to track progress and to plan interventions to tackle the disease. Latent variables have also been used to build upon the classical geostatistical model. So a latent variable um, is a variable which is not directly observed um, but it is inferred through other variables which are. So this method has been um, proven useful in one of the projects that I'm currently working on about estimating earthquake building damage. So conventionally, earthquake engineers model damage um, by relating it to underlying ground motion intensity measures, such as log of PGA, which is peak ground acceleration. So the higher the intensity measure, the higher the expected damage. And so a latent variable for the propensity for damage might look a bit like z equals to x beta, as shown here, where x is log PGA and beta is some positive coefficient. Um, however, in practice, in data poor regions, this log PGA is often modeled rather than measured and studies have shown that there are spatially correlated differences between the model and the measured log PGA. In addition, there is also a widely held but less examined view that there's additional spatial correlation in damage that is not fully attributed to the chosen ground motion intensity measure. So in this project, we are trying to model this phenomena as well as provide some evidence for it. So one way we can do this is to add um, Gaussian processes for the different factors of the spatial correlation to the latent variable. So for the spatial correlation in log PGA, we can add E of S over here. Um, for the additional spatial correlation in building damage, we can add U of S. And then based on the mean of this latent variable, we can compute probability um, of exceeding certain damage state, um, certain damage grades. Um, so in the bottom left plot over here, um, we have denoted by the vertical lines, cutoff values for the different damage grades. And the shaded area here represents the probability of exceeding damage grade five, because we are looking at the area beyond the fifth cutoff point. So modeling spatial correlation in damage um, has implications for estimating the risk. And in particular, um, we show using simulations from earthquake models, as well as this damage model, 
that when we account for more sources of spatial correlation, uh, we see higher risk of more extreme portfolio losses, regional portfolio losses. Spatial correlation um, and modern spatial dependence has been useful for our prediction, but it is a double-edged sword. Um, studies have also shown that there are um, underappreciated consequences of neglecting spatial dependence when it is present. Specifically, when we assume that we have independence, um, we are actually making the assumption that the more data that we gather, the better we can estimate our what, um, whatever process that we are interested in um, by improving its accuracy as well as precision. However, when there's actually dependence, then we have less independent samples than we are assuming, and this would lead us to overstate our confidence and underestimate our standard errors, and could potentially also affect variable selection and lead to model misclassification. Such an issue also arises in environmental model calibration. Um, where, for example, scientists might use spatial surveys like that shown in the map over here um, for volcano ash load um, to try to estimate the or try to model the process of volcano ash dispersal. And one way that they do this is to optimize loss functions. But these loss functions often implicitly assume independence, such as mean squared error. So one upcoming project that I'm looking at is to develop a weighted calibration um, procedure to incorporate spatial correlation in model calibration. And this would um, incorporate ideas from information theory, such as spatial entropy, uh, whereby the information contained in an observation is calculated um, as a function of its distance from its neighbors, as well as the spatial dependence present. So stay tuned for more of that. Um, to keep in touch, as well as to find out more about my other work, here's a QR code to my personal website. Um, I'd like to take this chance to also thank my collaborators, especially um, the people at the Disaster Analytics for Society led by NTU. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Michelle, for sharing the findings of your research. So we've got some questions coming in from the audience. So first question is, um, besides earthquake modeling, can you share any other applications potentially for your model over here? Um, yes. Yeah, I think it's quite general. So fragility models or damage models have been used for a lot of natural hazards. So you have typhoons, and in that case, instead of peak ground acceleration, you might win, you might use like the wind speed wind. Yeah, because um, what might happen there is actually you might be interested in the roofs whether they get um, damaged by the wind and so on. And then for floods, you might look at the water depth. And yeah, so I think these models are quite are quite um, applicable. You just have to adapt them in different situations. And then, then the spatial correlation could represent something else. Um, yeah, so it, it might be representing um, some ways in which there's spatial differences between your maybe hydraulic model and what you observe or, and so on. Yeah. Great. So a related question, I guess, and one that's probably quite relevant to our current um, current situation is whether we can employ spatial information between incidents and vaccination centers data sets to map the distribution and prevalence of COVID-19. Mm. Yes. So that, right, yeah, that, that is an interesting question. Thank you for that question. Actually, um, even... I would say it is possible. I think I, I know that people are looking into so-called like catchment areas or health health facilities. So that's I think that is along the same lines. So even when we were looking at malaria, for example, we were looking at where the cases were being reported and where was the nearest um, health facility and looking at how people seek treatment as well. So looking at treatment seeking patterns even spatially. So yeah, I, I think there is. There has been some work there, but it's still very much in the early stages, I think. 
great. Yeah. So, um, so the audience still thinks that, you know, this is a very cool application of GP regression. And they're interested to know whether you're able to apply MCMC methods to capture uncertainty in your infed parameters. In the infed parameters? Yes, MCMC methods to capture uncertainty in your infed parameters. Oh, infed parameters. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, there's been a lot of work on Asian spatial models, and some people have used MCMC methods. Um, an increasingly popular one is actually an approximation uh, method. It's called um, INLA, so integrated Laplace. Uh, next to approximation. So that's also based on very much a Bayesian framework, but also approximation. And a lot of people have been using that. Because um, one issue when we are dealing with spatial Gaussian processes is really the, the dimensionality problem. So you have large, theoretically, you would have large um, covariance matrix that you have to invert and take the uh, determinant off and so on. So yeah, a lot of work has been done in that direction as well. Okay, so there is one more question. And um, by spatial dependence, they wanted to clarify you mean spatial correlations between local sites, correct? And, yes. yeah. and how do you define the correlation functions or specify the correlation lengths? Is that from real systems? Oh, yes. Yeah, so, okay. Um, there are many ways you can go about it. So there are many different spatial correlation functions. I guess the most popular one is right now is the matern because of its flexibility. And also because it has, um, when you have like a Gaussian process with a matern covariance, you can link it to um, stochastic partial differential equations. So there's a nice link there and you can borrow techniques from the two different disciplines. Um, yeah, but otherwise, yeah, there's also, you can also, um, for other correlation functions, link it back to stochastic stochastic differential equations and then some people have done that I think in the wave equation and then you can derive like what kind of correlation mm -hmm. functions you should get um, yeah so there's yeah, yeah I see all right thank you very much for taking the time to share your research again with us and answering all the audience's questions yeah. um, yes thanks very much Michelle thank you.